Okay, guys, so these are the wave phenomenon notes. Um, I realize uh, that you will probably need some uh, more explanation on most of this, and so I'm going to place uh, in the bottom uh, an example for each of these, okay? Uh, maybe not for reflection and refraction, but definitely for the rest of them, okay? So uh, with reflection, with reflection uh, being the first one, uh, when a wave strikes a barrier that it cannot pass through and bounces off. So that's the important thing with reflection, when a wave hits a barrier and bounces off. This is perhaps the most important thing about this. Uh, first of all, there's something called a normal that uh, makes a right angle with the mirror. Okay, so there is a normal that makes a right angle with the mirror. Also, these angles here are important to know. That's theta i and theta r. Theta i is the angle of incidence, and theta r is the angle of reflection. And those two are those two angles are going to be equal to each other in a reflection. So the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection, um, and it's measured from the normal. So it's measured from the normal. And again, the normal makes a right angle with the mirror. All right. Uh, some examples of reflection would be an echo or a mirror on the wall. Uh, if, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think if there's any others that I want to mention right now. I think we're good. All right. So let's take a look at the next one. Uh, next one up is uh, refraction. So refraction occurs when a wave enters a new medium. So that's the key thing. It's got to enter a new medium. So for instance, if it goes from air into water, so light going from air into water, the bending is due to a change in the wave's speed as it enters the new medium. So what happens is, is the frequency is going to stay constant, but the speed is going to change. And so uh, since the speed is changing and the frequency stays constant, the wavelength also has to change. And so what basically is happening is that wavelength changing causes there to be a change in the, the way the wave moves, causes it to bend. The angle of refraction will bend uh, toward the normal if the wave is travels slower and away from the normal if the wave travels faster. So if you're going, uh, this is why it's hard to grab something that's underwater. So for example, if you're trying to stab a fish and it's right here, whenever the light from the fish goes out of the water, when it hits the normal, it's going, or whenever it leaves the water, it's going to bend away from the normal. And so when you're looking at it, it looks like the fish is coming from somewhere over here. I'm greatly exaggerating this, but it looks like the fish is over here. But in reality, the fish is right here. So when you try to grab something underwater, it's a lot more difficult because you got to plan on that angle of refraction. Um, these are some examples. So the farther you travel through the water, the more likely you are uh, to have refraction occurring. So here's an example of a straw with some fairly mild refraction. And then here's an example of a polar bear at a zoo with some fairly major refraction occurring because it's got longer to travel through. So imagine two roads diverging. The longer you travel on them, the farther apart you get. The, the bear's body is really right here. It's just that it's shifted because of the act of refraction occurring. Um, the, uh, the bear, uh, uh, it's very, very disconcerting to young children uh, when they see this. You can actually go see this at the Houston Zoo uh, if it opens back up soon. Uh, if you look at the hippo exhibit at the Houston Zoo, uh, a lot of times you'll see the hippo get above water, and when his head's above water, his body's shifted. It looks like his head is like, you know, a good solid three feet from where it should be. Um, by the way, the bear was not harmed in this. He's fine. I mean, I don't know if he's fine. The pitcher's old. He might be dead now, but he wasn't harmed here. All right. Uh, when a wave is bent as it goes around a barrier or through a, a gap, this is known as diffraction. Okay, uh, The lower the frequency, the more bending occurs, and the smaller the gap, the more bending occurs. So if you have a small gap, you're going to have more bending occurring than if you have a large gap. And if you have a higher frequency, or sorry, if you're going to have a lower frequency, 
this is the lower frequency one because it's spaced farther apart. Uh, if you have a lower frequency, you're going to have more bending than a higher frequency. Uh, so the example that I have for this, there's a, a tennis ball man. Uh, he's got, I call him tennis ball man. He's got a tennis ball colored shirt. Uh, if you watch the video that's going to have the guy with the tennis ball shirt in there, he is incredibly dull. But the little demonstration he does is very good at demonstrating diffraction. So if you want to see that, uh, please reference that video. Okay, so that's it for this page. Let's go to the next one. All right, uh, this one's about interference. So basically, uh, sometimes you'll hear it referred to as superposition, and other times you'll hear it referred to as interference. But this is when waves try to be try to sam simultaneously be in the same spot at the same time. Uh, simultaneously? Yeah, I think, I think I spelled it right. If I didn't spell it right, you're welcome to make fun of me. I apologize. All right, so uh, there are basically three ways to have superposition uh, or interference. So one is to be in phase. It's also known as zero degrees out of phase. If you have this occurring, you've got a perfect lineup between your crests and your troughs. So your crests and your troughs are lined up perfectly. Um, in that case, you get something that's known as constructive interference. If you're out of phase, it means that you have, uh, basically, you can look here, frequency one and two. Frequency one is in red, frequency two is in blue. You can tell they're not in phase. They're not lining up perfectly, but what they're doing is they're going in and out of phase. So at this point, they're in phase, and at these points, they're out of phase. And so what you get is a series of constructive and destructive interference patterns occurring. Um, if you're 180 degrees out of phase, this is known as uh, destructive interference, this is when you're perfectly out of phase and your troughs meet your crest, this will cancel the wave out. So uh, if we have constructive interference, constructive interference is when uh, waves amplify each other. We've got speakers and standing waves. Uh, basically, speakers amplify each other because they are like two uh, different sources of sound creating the same noise at the same time that are in phase and it amplifies the noise and makes it louder. So in other words, one speaker is quieter than two speakers. Um, destructive in interference, on the other hand, is when you are out of phase um, and what happens here is that the uh, two things interact and they cancel each other out. Um, noise canceling headphones do this. Uh, noise canceling headphones do a better job if it's a droning sound. So if it's like the background whine of an airplane or the car engine or something like that. But to make this a point so that you'll remember it, uh, basically what it does is it has a little microphone on the outside and when it hears crying baby, it plays anti-crying baby. And those, those sounds cancel each other out when they enter your ear, um, which is really a cool uh, phenomenon. Um, so. Also, with constructive and destructive interference, the amplitudes are basically adding together. So if this is an amplitude of 1, this is an amplitude of 1, that would be an amplitude of 2. If this was an amplitude of 1 and this is an amplitude of 3, it would be an amplitude of 4. Right? You just add the amplitudes together. Here, you've got 1 and 1, but like basically this one's positive 1 and this one's negative 1. And so this one's negative 1. So when you add them together, you get 0. And that's the reason it cancels out. If, on the other hand, you had this one adding with this one, you wouldn't cancel it out. Like if this is, let me just do, 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 If this is two and this is one, the result would be a wave that would be in the phase of the second wave, but having the amplitude of one. So if this has an amplitude of one, this has an amplitude of two, the resultant wave would have an amplitude of one, but be in phase with the second one because it was the larger, uh, larger of the two waves. All right, all right. Next up, we've got resonance. So resonance is an incredibly cool thing, and this is probably the one that it'll be the most difficult to show you. But it's an object vibrating at its natural frequency. Uh, this is the frequency that energy will naturally build up in, or it could be simply forcing an object to vibrate. So if you hit a table, and that sound that the table makes is the, is the resonance of that table. Um, if you uh, 
flit a wine glass, like if you just thump a wine glass, don't do it too hard, you don't wanna break the wine glass, but if you thump a wine glass, that sound it makes is its resonant frequency. Um, if you've ever dealt with tuning forks, uh, tuning forks resonate at a specific sound. And so basically what we're showing here, I would do this demonstration, but I can't figure out a way to get the sound to pick up. Uh, I don't have a good microphone. Um, basically, it's a tuning fork. You hit the tuning fork here, and it causes this other tuning fork to vibrate. And so even though this thing wasn't moving at the beginning, uh, it is at the end. Um, you can also, uh, there's a, a wonderful little Mythbusters video I'll link where they break a wine glass using sound. Uh, because they match its natural frequency. Uh, there's also something known as the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, where basically the uh, bridge resonated with the like buffeting of the wind, and it caused the bridge to come tumbling down. All right? So that's resonance. Uh, again, I'll post some videos underneath. Basically what I'm going to have is like diffraction, interference, resonance, uh, and then I'll have some video links for you to watch if you want to. All right? Uh, when waves constructively interfere with themselves, this is known as a standing wave. So at your leisure, what I would recommend you doing is taking a look at the different types. So this is a closed closed. So it's closed on both ends. And what that means, it's like a guitar string. The guitar string is closed at both ends. I'm not even going to try to draw a guitar string. But if you've got a closed, like a string that you've got closed on both ends and then you strum it, all right, it creates uh, this type of wave. The important thing is, is the first one is called the fundamental, and then afterwards we're going to worry about second, third, fourth harmonic, all right? The thing that's nice about this is if you create a standing wave in a given medium, as long as you're maintaining a constant for that medium, basically there are certain instances where the sound will be loudest. So the first harmonic is where you get the, like, let's, we're just going to, I'm just going to use sound, but the wave is the strongest. Uh, so if, I, if you're doing a string, it'd be the strongest wave. Uh, I'll just use strongest. So this is where the fundamental is where it's the strongest. You've got the biggest amplitude. Um, the second one is next strongest. The third one is next strongest. The fourth one is next strongest, but they only happen at certain points. So there's only certain points where they happen because you have to create these wavelengths. Uh, these specific wavelengths. So notice that, first of all, this right here is half of a wavelength. You've got node and node, so that right there is just half a wavelength. This is an antinode. I'm going to call it an antinode. This whole thing right here is called an antinode. And each antinode is half a wavelength. So this next one is one wavelength, then one and a half wavelengths, then two wavelengths, and so on. Now, in addition... Something else that's nice to know is that in addition, you have uh, the frequency of this fundamental is known as the fundamental frequency. So we're just going to call that F. The next harmonic happens at 2F. The next harmonic happens at 3F. The next harmonic happens at 4F. So if you know the fundamental frequency is 10, then you can say what the 10th harmonic is. It would be 100. You just multiply it by 10. All right. If you know the fundamental, if you know the the fifth harmonic is a hundred, then the first harmonic has to be twenty. You just divide them, uh, and so that's what this formula is right here. F n is equal to n f. So that that what that means is the frequency of the number harmonic that you're on is equal to that number times the fundamental frequency. All right. So we just looked at closed closed. So let's take a look at the other two. There's two other types. Um, Ah, here we go. There's two other types. Uh, this one is known as an open, oops, I'm sorry, is known as a closed and open. Now, closed and opens are a little bit different. It has the number of wavelengths here. So the, the first harmonic occurs at the one-fourth wavelength, then the three-fourths wavelengths, then the five-fourths wavelengths, and so on. Closed opens skip harmonics. You don't have a second harmonic. It's only odd-numbered harmonics, so it's a little bit different. Um, and then uh, you have, uh, e basically, each one grows by half a wavelength each time. So that's an important thing. For all of these, the next harmonic is going to be half a wavelength in growth. But for closed opens, there's no even numbers, all right? So there's no even numbers. You don't have, if it's a closed open, you won't have a second harmonic. 
So things that are like this are like horns or flutes or something like that. Um, the uh, open open is basically the opposite of the closed. It's the same thing. The first one you have half a wavelength, and I know that's a little bit difficult to see, but if you take this part right here and cut it out, you've got this shape. And if you take this part over here and cut it out, you've got this shape, which is the same thing we saw on the first, on um, the fundamental over there. And so this one's the same thing. You've got, uh, you're adding half a wavelength each time, uh, and you create the second, third, fourth harmonic. Now, open, open, it does go all the way through. Closed, open are the only ones where you don't. Open, open uh, are things like uh, xylophones, okay? Those little things that you hit and the, the music uh, comes out of the metal. Uh, also, uh, just if you have an open pipe or something like that uh, that you're you're doing, you might have played with boom whackers when you were a little kid. If you don't know what that is, just, well, I don't know if you should Google it. I don't know. Boom whacker toy? I never know what to Google anymore. But it's just a, it's a little toy uh, that you can use. Um, let me see if we can find a picture. All right, I found a picture. Here we go. Let's see if we can pull it up. Boom. All right. So this is a boom whacker. Those are uh, open, open. They're, they can't have a, a thing at the end, but if you take the thing, the little piece of uh, plastic off at the end, it's an open, open. If you put the piece of plastic on, it's an open, close. Uh, Y'all might have played with those at some point. All right. Um, all right, next up. Let's see if we can go to the next thing. Uh, there we go. Uh, the next thing is the Doppler effect. Whoops. Is that crooked? There we go. Uh, I don't know if that's crooked or not. I'm sorry. Uh, the Doppler effect. So the Doppler effect is the apparent increase or decrease in the frequency of a wave depending on the motion of the source or the receiver. So there's a formula here. Uh, I would advise you just to kind of take a look at it. Basically, it's the frequency that you hear. So the frequency that's observed is equal to the original frequency and then times the speed of sound well, in this case, the speed of sound, because we're mainly dealing with sound. So the speed of sound divided by the speed of sound minus the velocity. What you should notice about this is the slower you're going, the less of an effect you're going to have. The faster you're going, the more of an effect you're going to have. So the reason typically when you're walking around, you don't hear people's voices go higher or lower in pitch is that they're not traveling fast enough to have an, a noticeable effect. Uh, you really need to be somewhere around 10% the speed of the wave, which is about 60 miles per hour in order to hear the effect. Uh, this effect is known in technical jargon as the neom effect. Uh, it's when, I'm just kidding, it's not technically that. But if you, uh, if you hear a, like a siren coming towards you, it increases in pitch as it moves towards you and decreases in pitch as it moves away from you. So as you move, uh, as you move, towards the sound, the wavelengths appear to shorten, and therefore the frequency increases. And as you move away from the sound, the wavelengths are going to increase, which is going to cause the frequency to decrease. And it's just an effect of the moving sound. If it helps you to imagine this, imagine you're standing in place throwing baseballs the exact same distance. So if you're throwing baseballs 80 feet each time, Every time you throw a baseball, it's going to land 80 feet from you, all right? Now, you take your bag of baseballs and you start walking towards the, the direction that you're throwing. Now, every time you throw a baseball, you're still throwing it 80 feet, but when it lands, it's not going to be 80 feet from you since you're walking towards it. It's not going to be 75 feet from you, say, all right, because you're walking towards it. It's, it's apparent shortening of the distance. Even though you're throwing at the same distance, the distance from you is, is decreasing because you're walking towards it. Same thing is happening in the Doppler effect, and it creates an interesting sound. Uh, there's also redshift and blue shift. This is what happens with light. If you hear the term redshift and blue shift, it doesn't mean that it's turning red or it's turning blue. It's just shifting toward the red end of the spectrum. So red, if it gets redshifted, may shift back to a darker color. Or green, if it gets redshifted, may get shifted to yellow. But if it's blue shifted, uh, it may red may end up shifting to maybe an orange. Uh, green may end up be shifting to a teal, all right? Uh, but again, you have to be moving incredibly fast to notice this. So again, about 10%, the 10% of the speed of the wave. 
uh, which would be in this case about three million, three or sorry, thirty million meters per second, uh, which most of us aren't capable of moving. Uh, and so that's the reason you don't typically notice people's colors changing as they move towards or away from because we're not going anywhere near fast enough for that to happen. All right. So next up, we've got uh, beats. So beats occur when waves are not the same frequency. They can create an alternating pattern of constructive and destructive interference, a whoop, 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 whoop sound. Uh, the, if you're in music, this probably makes a little bit more sense. If you're not, I'm sorry. Uh, I will find a little example for you. Uh, the uh, blank in frequency is the number of beats per second, so the difference in frequency will be the number of beats per second. So for example, if you have 100 uh, hertz uh, speaker playing and then another one that's 105 hertz, then the beats will occur at a rate of five hertz. All right, so you'll have five beats per second. So it'll be like woo -woo 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 -woo. If you have 100 hertz and 101 hertz, it's gonna be a frequency of one hertz. So it'll be like woo 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 woo. Um, the farther apart they are, the uh, less uh, or the uh, quicker the beat happens. And once you get past a certain point, once you get about past 50, you can't hear them anymore. It just kind of merges into the same sound because the beats are happening so fast. Um, when a wave is partially or wholly reduced to traveling in one direction, uh, this is known as uh, this is known as polarization. Okay, so polarization is when a wave is partially or wholly reduced to traveling in one direction. Only happens in transverse waves. Um, so unpolarized uh, light is uh, unpolarized light basically is moving in all directions, and polarized light is moving in a single direction. You see a couple little diagrams there. Uh, this I had on the board. I was showing my students before we left, uh, but basically you could polarize the light. The light coming from the projector was polarized, and so if you uh, had the uh, polarized lens one way, it allowed green light through, and if you polarize the other way, it allowed red light and blue light through. Um, movie theaters polarize their images, so whenever you are watching a, a movie and you've got like those two images that are overlaid, the way that you see a three-dimensional image is you got those two images overlaid, well, one allows you to see one of your uh, lenses allows you to see image number one, and one allows you to see image number two, and you put that together to form a uh, image in your mind that is three-dimensional. All right. Uh, last few here, you've got modulation. Modulation is the altering of waves to affect communication. We all modulate our sound in order to communicate. If we were not capable of modulating our sound, all we would be able to do is just go, uh, which can't really do anything. Um, if you can modulate it at all, you can have communication. So for example, uh, the uh, communication that's through Morse code is just a series of longs and shorts. So like SOS, uh, which is a, a distress signal, would be uh, da da da. Da, 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 da. So that's communication. Uh, the more you can modulate your sound, the better you can communicate. So like for humans, we have a great deal of modulation we can do. We can change our pitch, we can change our, uh, we can change our amplitude, and it can create different meanings through all those different things. All right, uh, absorption, absorption. I believe I spelled this right. If I didn't, please forgive me. When a wave is partially or wholly absorbed, uh, as a wave goes through a barrier. It's weird because there's a P here, but there's a B here. I think that's right, though. Uh, basically, absorption is when a wave is absorbed by going through a wall. This is why, typically, uh, you can't hear what the other classrooms are saying because of absorption unless somebody's playing a really loud video. All right? And finally, we have energy. The energy in a wave is uh, equal, or sorry, not equal, is related to the square of the amplitude. The energy of the wave decreases with distance. This should make sense when you're speaking. The farther you are away, the less somebody can hear you. Uh, the energy of the wave is also indirectly related to the square of the distance. So the farther you are away, the smaller uh, the energy 
you have. All right, so hopefully this helps you guys. Um, I am going to post this and then post some of the other uh, examples. Uh, it won't be completely comprehensive, but I'll try to post them for most of the different uh, most of the different uh, types or phenomenons.